So, good evening. Um, for those of you who have not been to a Friday night at the Cary before, I'm Josh Ginsburg, the president of the Cary Institute. It is a pleasure to see a full house. Um, you guys have to keep coming because I keep expecting that we will have a full house now. Uh, since I arrived in September, we have had nothing but a full house. And so I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this evening. You know, for those of you uh, looking around and seeing the, the little tags on the back of a bunch of seats tonight, we have a phenomenal turnout of our Aldo Leopold Society members. These are people who make contributions to the Institute at a level that does many things for them. First of all, it makes them feel great about supporting the mission of the institution, and particularly things like these Friday night lectures and other outreach that we do. Uh, more to the point, it gives them uh, first dibs on the seat. So as we get fuller and fuller, um, I would urge more and more of you to think about becoming an Alma Leopold Society so you are not disappointed in the overflow outside. Um, you'll also notice that tonight's lecture has a little subtitle to it, the Ned Ames Honorary Lecture. I just apologize to Ned for embarrassing him, but I will proceed to do so. Um, we honor Ned tonight because I think quite simply without Ned there would be no Cary Institute. People argue with me about that. But he was a trustee and the manager of the Mary Flagler Cary uh, Charitable Trust, and that trust helped in the 70s to establish the Cary Arboretum. Uh, in the 80s, it went out and hired Gene Likens, and Ned was instrumental in hiring Gene to launch uh, what was then the Institute of Ecosystem Studies uh, at the old uh, Canoe Hill um, estate. And Gene, through the support of the trust and by hiring some remarkable ecologists, a whole bunch of remarkable ecologists, um, was able to take that estate and turn it into one of the premier uh, ecological and ecosystem research institutes, not just in, in Millbrook or New York, in the United States, but globally. Um, Ned also did something that was even harder than all that, which was to help establish the independence of the Institute from the New York Botanical Gardens. And it was a separation that was done gracefully and with aplomb, and something that uh, would not be considered an easy thing to do under any circumstances. Um, and if that weren't enough, if that were all Ned did, then we would have still wanted to honor him. But when the Mary Fowler Cary Charitable Trust uh, dissolved, they had a bit of money left over, quite a bit of money left over. And to ensure that the support that they had been giving the Institute for almost 20 years continued, they uh, donated that money to the Institute to establish uh, the corpus of our endowment and to ensure, if not in perpetuity for quite a long time, we could continue to do good, with, good work here. So, you know, along with Gene, I think Ben is one of our founding fathers. And, um, you know, I would like to thank him for that. Right? In addition to that, because again, it's that, we're just not enough. Uh, Ned has also just been involved with many, many things in the Hudson River Valley. I have the pleasure of serving on both the Catskill Mountain Keeper and the Open Space Institute boards with Ned. He also, in his local life, living in Riverdale, New York, is on the board of Wave Hill. Um, he's on the Governing Council of the Wilderness Society and has been for a few years. Uh, since 1980. Um, and he has received their Robert Marshall Award, which is the Wilderness Society's highest honor. Um, and it wasn't just for longevity, but I think it was for impact as well. Um, I can keep going on. You know, I think Ned only has one great failing. As a Yale man, I hate to say that he graduated from Harvard, but at least he did his undergraduate degree in biology. So, Ned, thank you very much for uh, decades of support and friendship. I would say that would be a hard one to follow. Right? And I would give my commiserations to our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Rosman Naylor from Stanford University. But it's not a hard one to follow. Um, I have done a little bit of, as the Brits say, swatting up on um, uh, Professor Naylor, and uh, she's a remarkable woman as well. Um, you know, when I got up this morning, I, I thought I was going to have to apologize to Ros. Because, you know, despite having gone to BA, University of Colorado, and then going to uh, the London School of Economics for her MSc, and having lived in London for five, six years, I, it's not, it's, it has some beautiful weather. It's underrated, but it is a little damp uh, and a little cold. Um, uh, she had the sense to do her PhD at Stanford and then uh, remain in the beautiful Northern California. 
So I thought on one hand I needed to apologize for winter persisting so long. But on the other hand, it's cold and wet here. And I'd like to emphasize the wet because part of food security is water. A big piece of it is water. And we got it, and they don't. Right? And, and we will have more and more of it, and they will have less and less of it. So should you consider a second career at the Cary Institute, please let me know. Ross is the director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment and has name chairs that are almost too many to name, so I will not. Um, but she bridges a tremendous number of disciplines at Stanford, and Stanford is a place uh, with the Wood Center for the Environment, uh, founded by the board chair of the Wildlife Conservation Society of War of the Woods and my former boss, so again, I need to be nice. Um, but you know, the Wood Center and other centers at Stanford really are integrative in a way that is rare in the university setting, and you know, particularly in a university setting like Stanford, which is full of brilliant people, to have them working together is, is a real pleasure. Her areas of expertise are also diverse and broad. She's an economist by training, but her interests cut across the disciplines related to food security and environmental impacts of, of how we grow our food. When I say how we grow our food, I'm not just talking about plants. Talking about animals, I'm not just talking about animals, but about fish. And not just fish, she studies aquaculture, the impacts of aquaculture. And also the impacts of El Nino events on rice crops in China. Right? And so it's this breadth of interest uh, that I think will allow Roz to bring together the threads of what is the most important question. Um, it is often phrased of how do we feed the next two billion people. And I find that rather narrow. I think how do we feed the current seven billion people and the next two billion people. And so she will be talking about food security uh, and feeding the world in the 21st century. Roz, thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. It's, it sounds like it's on. Okay. It's really nice to be here tonight. What a great audience. And I had uh, the pleasure of meeting some of you at the reception. I was drinking straight vodka. You were only drinking wine, so I'm ahead of you already. Um, and it's really fun to have a chance to talk to you about um, some a topic I've been involved in for quite some time, feeding the world, um, and more specifically on uh, food security. And so let me define a little bit what I'm talking about and then just launch in. I'm going to have lots of issues uh, to have a conversation with you about at the end of this. When we think about food security, what we're um, thinking about essentially are four things. First is the availability. You know, can the world produce enough food to feed 7 billion today and potentially 9, 10 billion in the future, given the increasing resource constraints, given the changes in climate, and, um, and given the increasing demands that we have on the system. So this is really kind of the food systems segment of it, but it's looking at the supply side and the supply side is really only one part of what I do and one, only a small part, really, of the food security question. The demand side is uh, really, can people afford to buy food? Do they have economic access? And many of the poorest people in the world actually are involved in agri agriculture and fisheries for their livelihoods. So how these systems are shaped and provide incomes is important to them. What are the prices of food? Can we actually provide and grow enough food and produce enough food at prices that are affordable to the poorest billion? I think is a really essential question in the field that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And it goes beyond just calories. I think there has been an emphasis in this field in past decades to think about calories and just can we produce enough calories? Obviously, we need the right nutrition for physical cognitive development and for welfare and stability in countries. Um, and stability, I'm thinking really about price stability that's caused by uh, economic shocks that we've seen recently, climate shocks, um, and so forth. And if that stability, when prices start bouncing around for food, it's those poor households that spend 80% of their incomes on food that are hurt the most. They just can't tolerate a big price spike. When that happens, often, Maybe they'll have fewer meals a day. The girls or the women won't be uh, eating as much as the men and so forth. And so this is the core aspect of food security. Um, and we need to think about it today in the sense not only of producing food, but also producing animal feed for the, lives, the meat products that we eat 
as well as biofuels and the fuel that we put in our gas tank. And I like to think of it on the left here as really a systems in rich countries, middle income countries, poor countries, because all of these countries are connected through markets um, and through even climate change, right? And ultimately, what we care about is that food on the table. So not just agriculture for the sake of agriculture, but what the aim is, is for the food system itself. And so thinking about it, um, we have 7.3 billion right now, moving towards 9 billion or 10 billion. And increasingly in urban areas, um, over half of the world's population currently lives in urban areas, and it will become much more so in the future. Um, and as we think about this scenario, this picture looks pretty friendly. <laughs> People are uh, well fed and so forth. But in those circumstances where food isn't available at the prices that people can afford, that's when these situations turn into riots, overthrowing governments, and so forth. We've seen plenty of those in a recent food crisis in 2008. Tunisia was the classic example of uh, sort of kicking off the Arab Spring. It wasn't all about food security, but people initially went into the streets because the price of food went up. Once they're in the streets, they realize, oh, I'm not too happy about a lot of things. So, um, and that is typically how it goes. And so the linkages that we see, it's way beyond food and agriculture that I want to talk to you about tonight and that I work on and that this book is all about. It's about the connections between energy security, water security, climate variability, and climate change that cause those shocks the environmental outcomes of our attempts to feed the world, uh, national security, health and infectious diseases. And at Stanford, um, the book is really an attempt to bring our community together around the topic of food security. And what fascinates me is how many really, really interesting entry points there are to this discussion and really good work that can be done. And so when I think of the enormity of the challenge of feeding even seven billion today, let alone nine billion in the future, I think we need the best minds at work, whatever discipline they're trained in. And it's just very interesting how they all intersect. And so as an economist, uh, one of the questions um, from an economist's point of view that we might ask, how are we doing now? You know, are we actually staying ahead? Are we running out of food? What does it look like? And so an economist will typically look at prices. And if supply is keeping up with demand, prices will either be steady or they'll be going down. And if demand is outpacing supply, like many anticipate, then prices are going to be going up. And so just looking at prices here for 1960 uh, to uh, 2015, um, this orange bar is the nominal price, so the market price that you see, and of course that's been going up over the years with some variability. And the yellow price is the real inflation adjusted price, and that's the one that we typically care about. Um, it's kind of been, you know, bouncing around the same, the same um, level here, and so it's really hard to say. It seems like we're doing an okay job keeping up, but I think the big question is this period more recently with these big price spikes that we've seen and these big <laughs> declines. And, and uh, I think we're really at a critical juncture in the global community to say, how are we doing? And, uh, and what is going to be happening to those prices? And you can already tell from comments I've made, when prices are bouncing around like this, the extremely poor households um, really struggle with, with that kind of volatility. So I think we're at a big juncture, and um, even though we're keeping pace with that yellow bar altogether, I find it incredibly disheartening, in fact, given all the economic progress that we've made in this world, and all the technological progress. I'm in the Silicon Valley, so I see a lot of that every day. That we still have 800 million to 1 billion people that every single day wake up not having enough food just for a productive and active life. And so the thought of struggling to figure out how I was going to feed my kid and knowing that there's a billion in that category, more or less, um, to me is something, you know, we've got to be doing a better job. So where are these people? Uh, where we might expect the highest rates are, of course, in many of these countries that have been um, undergoing 
pretty serious conflict and lack of governance and so forth. Nine of the ten of these countries that have the highest rates of malnutrition and food insecurity are in Africa. Um, well, Haiti is the other one. And um, so you have these very high rates, but these don't actually contribute to the highest numbers. And the highest numbers are in countries that are actually doing very well economically and their growth rates are extremely rapid right now. So India being the country that has the highest numbers, about 325 million people are food insecure in India and um, about 43% of the kids estimated are stunted, meaning that um, their height for their age is low, they've, they've suffered pretty prolonged malnutrition. Um, and yet, India still has invested a lot in agriculture. They have surpluses of corn and soy. They export rice to Africa. So, you know, how do we make sense of this? They're not doing an adequate job really feeding their own country. China, of course, the world's big growth economy, still has about 130 million, about uh, out of 1.3 billion, um, that are undernourished. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And yet they've got this gigantic cash reserve. Can't they use that cash reserve somehow to solve this problem? So these are more complicated than what's on the surface, obviously. I was talking um, to Sarah, I don't know where she is in the audience, about uh, China's new development bank. They're using a lot of this capital now to go out and provide development funds um, externally. And so the question is, uh, what are they doing internally as well? And so it's really all countries, including the United States, that are part of the challenge of meeting food security. So uh, if you take uh, the roughly one billion, billion people who are food insecure, you can go to the FAO um, database and see that they're on average about 200 calories per day deficit of what's needed for an active working life and you multiply that out What's needed just to solve the basic energy problem here is about three million tons of grain. And so, you know, is that achievable? You know, this is the availability. Can we get this availability? Well, that's about equal to about a sixth of what we're currently converting to fuel for our gas tanks. So, obviously, we can meet the calorie needs. This is not about insufficient calories. It's about a system that has different incentives and different priorities, and so how do we actually match objectives with uh, the priorities that the political, you know, politicians in every country take? So, you know, we are already uh, putting six times as much into our gas tanks, and so it's a it's a really complicated question, actually. So, um, let's start with those bottom, the poorest billion. And these are typically uh, communities that live in really difficult, difficult areas. Um, areas that aren't as fertile in terms of their agriculture. Most of the poor are in agriculture or rural settings. Uh, they may be in you know, high altitude <coughs> Andy settings uh, that are fairly marginalized. Africa, only 5%. Um, is irrigated, 95% is still rain fed, and so a lot of these communities face at least an eight month complete dry season that they're dealing with. Um, or low technology, Bangladesh, you know, sometimes too much water. <laughs> so we've got the water, as Josh mentioned, coming in. But it's not just about the agriculture and the agricultural growing and technology conditions here. It's also about just the general conditions in which these people live. For example, you know, two and a half billion people are getting their water out of these public um, facilities or you know, don't have safe drinking water necessarily. And so even if this girl here um, were to have a full plate of food on, um, every day, she probably has a number of bacteria and so forth um, in her system due to unsafe drinking water that don't allow her actually to absorb all the nutrients she's getting. You know, we talk about secondary malnutrition just occurring when there's diarrheal diseases and other infections that are permeating through the system. And one of my colleagues just on Friday, who's in the medical school, was showing two pictures. He said, when's the last time you thought about your small intestine? <laughs> Which nobody really had been thinking about their small intestine that day. But for all of us, it turns out that the small intestine, you know, has a lot of uh, a lot of walls. You know, it's got a large surface area of which um, to um, 
to operate and to, um, to transfer nutrients and so forth. But in highly disease burdened populations, in which this girl lives here on the left, uh, it's just chock full of infections and so forth and, and almost all the surface area is gone and so it really can't actually function like a normal intestine does anymore. And so there's, you know, clinical names and so forth for all of this. But these are conditions of which a lot of people are food insecure because of that kind of environment. And in India, particularly, you see this um, not only because of the lack of drinking water, but the lack of sanitation. I don't know if many of you saw, there was a New York Times article last year that really pointed out 50%, half the Indian population still defecates outside, doesn't have modern plumbing. And so it seems like solving the sanitation problem as opposed to the food problem helps with the food security. So I'm giving you a sense of how connected these issues are and where the entry points can be quite different depending on the case. Now, during the past 50 years, a lot of the progress in actually improving food security, and there have been improvements over the decades, has come from introducing technology that has enabled fairly poor farmers to get much higher yields on their land and then become surplus producers, be able to have incomes, purchase food, send their kids to school, uh, take secondary jobs, and so forth. And so this green revolution, which is what I'm showing here, was uh, classical breeding, Mandelian breeding of just an Indonesian variety that was pretty robust with the Taiwanese variety that was short stature. And so it was really taking a plant, rice or wheat, um, breeding it with just classical, this is not GMO, you know, breeding so that um, the um, so the, the plant architecture would be lower, it could absorb nutrients when you had especially irrigation water, allocate more grain to, um, allocate more nutrients to the grain, and not topple over whenever it rained or when there was a windstorm. And so almost instantly, in, when you had regions that had access to uh, predictable water, could get nutrients and so forth, you had really a doubling or tripling of yields, and it was phenomenal, I think, what we've seen in globally cereal production since the 1970s to 2010 and still today, where yields have risen, this is uh, tons per hectare in rice, wheat, corn, gone up enormously. The area harvested for these crops globally really hasn't changed much, so we're not necessarily moving into new areas for these crops. We're doing it all through just powering the agricultural land that we have. And I think that's going to be absolutely essential for those of us who care about natural ecosystems at all, is to figure out how we can remain intensive and take the burden off of the environment. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. And the Green Revolution is a highly debated topic. It had pros and cons in different locations, but I think that um, if we hadn't had it, and we were trying to feed, and there was massive famines in the 60s um, in particular that this was addressing, there would have been quite a big triage as well as quite a big movement into natural areas. And so it's always interesting to think about the counterfactual in these cases. But um, it does take investments in technology. And so where is technology heading? And I'd like to have a conversation with you about this more generally. But when we look at just public spending, so not private, but public spending that could reach the poor um, in agricultural technology from 1960 again to 2005, to you can see huge gains in high income countries like us. You've seen some gains in Asia and Pacific, particularly China, India, Indonesia, you know, have put a lot of money into technology, but much less so still than these high income countries. This doesn't even include the private investment, as I mentioned. But Sub-Saharan Africa still really, really lacks, like nothing is really uh, going on there, you know, no, no real investments in trying to get agriculture moving. We know Gates is in there, but this, is, uh, this has been a really challenging area. And um, for me, when I look forward, I think, wow, the stakes are really high. So what this picture is showing is um, the United Nations estimate for the next century, out to the end of this century, where the additional population is going to be. And so two and a half billion here in Africa and relatively little in these other locations, Europe's going to go down. So, you know, we better be thinking about how Africa is going to be fed. At least that's one of my main concerns. 
And, and it's a concern because when I go into the field, this is a picture I took of a young woman in Benin, West Africa. And, um, and when I went into the village, it was at the end of the dry season. And I know she had been um, <coughs> malnourished probably since she was in the womb, had these, you can see kind of the glassy eyes and so forth, energetic, the kids always run up to you like they always do. But this kind of stunting in those first two years actually does create really irreversible cognitive impairment as well as physical impairment. And so um, not stopping this pattern, if you can't break into this pattern, it can become quite generational in terms of the development trajectory. How, what, what are the possibilities for these communities to even get out of poverty? It becomes much, much more challenging. One of the projects that we've had in this area um, is to say, okay, is it just about agriculture and the seed varieties? You know, they grow yams and stuff. Um, no, you know, it's, it's about much more than that. It's about water, it's about energy. It turns out that, you know, Africa does have a lot of water even though very little is irrigated. It tends to be fractured. Uh, it's an old continent. <laughs> um, and, but you've got, you know, the Nile running big and then, or I mean, uh, the Niger River running big in this, in this area that we were working in and right next to it, very impoverished communities. Um, and they don't have the energy to, to lift the water to the plots. And so um, one of my postdocs who's now at the University of San Diego um, was a physics PhD. And she came to me and said, I really want to work on this problem. And let's, let's bring my expertise into it. So she actually designed these solar powered systems that are directly coupled. They don't need any batteries. They can lift water uh, from groundwater up to 30 meters in depth, actually, and fairly large surface water transfers. And uh, what we're allocating them is through drip irrigation systems, not to the yams, but to these higher valued vegetables that have much more nutritional quality. And these are now grown throughout the year. And um, specifically targeting them to these women's cooperatives um, women are the ones that put the house, the food on the table in these communities and also the ones that have to carry all the water. And we found so many benefits from this project and it's now expanding out quite rapidly. Um, but one of the benefits is that these women now have double or triple the income and if anything they're lying a little bit about the income because they don't want it taken away from them. But we've been recording their nutritional outcomes too. We've been doing the nutritional tests and so forth, and the quality of nutrition, not just in these communities, but in neighboring ones that come and buy the produce, is phenomenal. You know, it's really just a, a, a order of magnitude improvement. Um, and these women put the products out in the street market at 5 in the morning, it's all gone by 5.15, and they're obviously keeping some for their own households. The part of the story I like the best is that now that they are able to lift the water and bring it this way, the girls in the community are back in school. And so this population, Niger has the highest uh, population growth of any country. Uh, if you're not sending girls to school and giving them better opportunities, it's very hard to bring that population down. And so it's, it's this kind of integrated system that I see the real hope in. Indonesia is another country that I've worked in and it was really benefited from the Green Revolution. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, and here was one that was much more of a case of national security as well as the need just to, you know, try to solve some uh, basic poverty. Sukarno, the, the year of living dangerously when Indonesia was literally blowing up in a civil war. Uh, this was the time that President Suharto um, really adopted um, a, a pattern of rural development. And um, Suharto, for all his faults of corruption and, and, and everything, um, really cared about rural development. And so that's a key point. And so it's murky and gray sometimes in terms of the uh, quality of leadership. But he really did care about this. And, um, and a few interesting things in his case for running the largest Muslim uh, country in the world one of his main goals was to put out rural health clinics. And so he was not only focused on agricultural production, but on the uh, keeping the infectious disease load down so that people could act actually absorb the nutrients. And so really interesting story about how that policy process has actually worked in Indonesia. China did very much the same thing after uh, the Mao period really got, uh, got on a much better track in terms of 
um, raising yields, uh, getting agricultural development moving. And these two countries alone, you know, over one generation, uh, lowered poverty and hunger from about 70% of their population down to about 15% through the strategy of rural development. And so it was really quite phenomenal. And with it came sort of demographic transition. And it brought the whole global rates down. So when you look at the whole global rates over time, it's driven a lot just even by these two countries. But so you think, OK, nice story all over. But actually, um, they're now facing the second food security challenge. And this is part of the evolving sphere. And China, in particular, is really, I think, very interesting in, in this respect. This is a picture I took in one of our field sites in Zhangji, um, kind of a rice-growing province in, in China. And um, when you go out in the field in China, what you see is older people and these young kids and all that middle generation has gone into the cities to work. And so it's the older people that kind of got through the Cultural Revolution, grew a lot of rice themselves, lived on just starchy staples and thinks that's fine. And so these kids are eating pretty much just starchy staples and they look okay. Um, but in fact, they're really malnourished. They don't have any of the micronutrients that they need actually for the cognitive development that is really upon them right now as China attempts to develop to the next stage of development and move forward. And so, um, so what's behind the scene here is a situation where in China you have an income uh, distribution, you have about 150 million people that are living under $2 a day and about 300 million living under $3 a day. So fairly wide income distribution now. You also have the most billionaires in the world in China, right? And so you've got this inequality that's developing here. And um, so when you look at the average per capita, it is rising. Um, and that absolute grinding poverty below is disappearing. But there's all these near poor that just aren't getting adequate diets. Um, they have, uh, they don't have the basic calorie diet, you know, deficiencies, but they have, um, they don't have any iron, they don't have any vitamin A, they don't have any zinc, you know, all these things that just kind of actually are in, in our, you know, already incorporated in a lot of our food products. And so, um, as China moves and wants to move from being a middle income country to being a rich country, what they care about is the quality of their human capital, quality of their education, how is this labor force going to move ahead? And so this is really not a good <laughs> situation for them to be um, so micronutrient deficient. And this is the hidden hunger question that affects maybe 3 billion people on the planet today. So we think about it um, in terms of uh, specific nutrients, for example, iron. Uh, when my colleague Scott Rosell, who does a lot of work in this area, went into the field and um, went out to the schools, and a lot of these kids were going to day school or boarding school, and he realized at, at recess, they all just go inside and take a nap, and he's like, this is not <laughs> supposed to be happening. You know, they're just, they're completely anemic, and when, uh, when, when infants are anemic, um, you know, their birth weights are low, infant mortality is higher, their IQ starts going down, and Scott's doing a lot of field level testing on this, which is really interesting right now, and accumulating quite a bit of uh, data on it. But he finds in school, their school performance is low, their attendance is low, IQ, their health is not good in other ways. And so, um, you know, what China is at risk of is that they will have very poor educational attainment and cognitive performance of the resource base that's most important to them right now, which is that human resource base. And China is mostly worried about social stability. So this is a big deal for them because if you have 130 million or 150 million people kind of left behind in the growth process in China, it's just not going to work for them at all in terms of national security. And so this is a, an issue that is not just confined to China. In fact, as we look across almost all of the emerging economies, middle income economies, all who are striving to be rich economies, they all have the same inequality in their income distribution. And so we're looking at Gini coefficients here, which are essentially measuring concentration of wealth. Anything over 40% means that most of the wealth is concentrated um, in that upper, 40% of the wealth is concentrated in that upper income strata. Um, and um, US, just as a comparison, is at about 42 right now. 
Um, and so a um, lot of inequality and a lot of the same problems. And what we call this is the middle income trap. Um, countries move forward in, in good ways, but if they have this part of the population that just uh, can't get on board in terms of education, jobs, health, and everything, it creates this big burden on the overall development process. And so guess what? <laughs> we actually have the same problem. This is not pointing fingers at any other country. We actually have one in, an estimated one in five kids in this country who go to school without sufficient nutrition. And to me, that is probably the most scandalous uh, statistic of all, given the progress that we have made as the world one, you know, world leader here. And it's not always apparent. You know, these kids, this what, they are just hungry, and they're just not really focused, and they're not eating good food at all. In fact, uh, this is um, this data on the SNAP program, which is the food stamp program here in the U.S. About 50 million <laughs> Americans are on the SNAP program. Um, and then many others aren't on the SNAP program, but they're going to soup kitchens and other you know, ways of getting food from the voluntary community. And so this is just a huge number. And, um, and when we look at the U.S. and, uh, and how much we spend on agriculture and, and the Farm Bill, and we passed the Farm Bill in 2014. Again, it's a bill that comes every five years or so. And we're spending, as taxpayers, about $100 billion a year on our farm bill, okay? And it is one of these omnibus legislations that's really quite amazing. I don't know how many of you, you follow the farm bill, but it would not occur if you didn't get the farm community and farm lobbyists in the same room with those that are lobbying actually for consumers in the urban areas here. And uh, we had some uh, Republican uh, politicians that tried to get you know, uh, just the farm without the consumer. We had the other way, um, and it doesn't—it doesn't work. It's an omnibus bill, and it only works when you have both sides in the room. And so, it's really a remarkable bill, and it goes way back to uh, the 1920s and 30s. And in fact, a lot of our committees um, are actually really formed. The congressional committees are formed around really historical farm interests. So, we have history here that plays a big role. It's not that easy to change. But one of the things that I want you to note in this is um, we've had fairly high food prices in the past five years or so. So this is not about spending necessarily on crop supports. 80% uh, is on our nutrition programs. Okay, so, so this is a big expenditure on um, a big safety net for, uh, for our for our you know uh, consumers in this country. And I would say that if we didn't have a big safety net, we might have to worry too about people taking to the streets and having less social stability. But we're one of the few countries that actually does have this big safety net. So this is all part of an interesting story because whatever the U.S. does now, if we put more uh, corn in our gas tanks and cause prices to rise, we're not worried about our own consumers rioting, but it might cause consumers in other countries to riot. There's a lot of spillovers that are quite interesting here. And ironically, and, and quite sadly, I think, is now we have this double burden here, or even triple burden, where we have obesity with malnourishment. And, and you didn't think it was possible, but in fact, most of the obese are the poor that are also malnourished. The cheapest calories are the, are the, uh, the bad ones, the sugars, the fats, the carbohydrates. And so we're in this state now, of this is our food system, don't we need to change it, right? So let me pose three different um, issues that I am thinking about a lot in the context of this, and then just open it up for a discussion, um, as if I haven't put enough on your plate already, I think. Um, but the first challenge I want to talk about is, is the idea of income growth and changing diets. Um, there's very rapid income growth in the emerging economies and other developing countries. And as those um, countries grow, they're aspiring to eat like we do. You know, they want more meat in their diets and animal products, milk, eggs, and so forth. And when they do, you know, it requires a lot more grain to feed those animals and so forth. To say nothing of the sort of a pollution from these kind of industrial systems. So this is in China, and um, my colleague Scott Rosell, who's looking at the kids that are uh, malnourished right now, he's saying, well, everybody in China should eat like at least 
one portion of pork every day, and we're saying, whoa, you know, this is going to be you know, like overwhelm the planet in terms of what happens if everybody starts eating meat. But China's rapidly escalating into a meat eating society. There's many more pigs in China than there are people in the United States, by the way. So, um, so it's interesting, and, and when we look at it, um, really for all middle income countries, um, Many of them have actually become middle income because they have succeeded at agricultural development. They were once poor like Indonesia was, um, but have succeeded and now they're industrialized and, and they're moving ahead. But in fact, uh, they had relied on um, nitrogen, irrigation water and so forth. And now there's a dependence there. I mean, they can't just stop using it because now they need productivity to rise even faster than before because they need the grain to feed the animals and so forth. So, so it's a uh, it's it's a really <coughs> difficult um, situation now. How fast can we have productivity grow? What is it being used for? And how are we going to do it well so that we don't really put stress on the environment? Can we do it without huge cost to society? We've had a project um, in the Yaqui Valley of Mexico, actually where the home of the Green Revolution was, and nitrogen and nitrogen loss from these systems are so huge. Um, and we have started to working with farmers to introduce these sensors, because nitrogen is high, highly mobile, as you know, and um, introduce sensors so they know, in fact, um, when they do need to apply, as opposed to prophylactically just applying huge amounts of fertilizer that then gets run off and released into the atmosphere. And so this is a field um, right here where, um, where they had applied 300 kilograms of nitrogen, just a huge amount um, on both sides. And this one here, um, this year they didn't apply any. <laughs> you can see just really the same yield. They didn't need all that extra nitrogen. Now nitrogen is something I've studied with different colleagues. I know it's a um, topic of research here at the Cary Institute too. But um, it's moving around the system. We're fixing more nitrogen now as humans than are fixed naturally by a long shot. And it's mostly through agriculture. It's not necessarily just through our uh, vehicles. And about 30%, 40% of nitrogen that we apply to crops gets taken up by the crop. And the rest is getting lost uh, through nitrification and denitrification, either as leaching into the groundwater system or as NOx or uh, nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so um, farmers need nitrogen to get high productivity, but if they're not applying it when the crop needs it, it's really um, a huge environmental cost to this. And of course, we are very familiar with uh, the, the Mississippi, all that nitrogen and um, nutrients coming down the Mississippi and creating these dead zones. So, you know, this is one of hundreds of dead zones in the world actually now that are caused. China has huge one, you know, a lot of countries that are intensively managing their agriculture have these dead zones. And there are spillovers because uh, this is from a land-based system, but it's affecting fisheries and another uh, fish-based system. So should we move, you know, move away from all this grain and, uh, and animal production in the fish? Fish is another topic of interest to me because it is so rapidly increasing in terms of the demands for fish. Um, as I mentioned, we have already doubled, you know, gone from 3 billion to 7.1 billion in 2013, um, where the fish consumed per capita for each of these is 7.1 billion. Uh, it's gone up from 9.5 doubled to 19.1. So you can imagine this fish demand is going way up. And, you know, there's only, uh, we're only going to catch so much from the oceans. I mean, we've topped out at about 80 million tons in the ocean now. So we are moving towards an aquaculture system, which is one of the real revolution areas. You know, I don't know revolution in a good sense, but it's, it's growing very rapidly. This is from 1990 baseline. Um, aquaculture has been growing at about 7.8 percent per annum, and just consider relative to poultry, which is 4.6, pork was 2.2. You know, it, it's just it's just booming. And so, um, what does that actually mean? Um, it's probably good to take pressure off the oceans. On the other hand, um, farm fish do need to be fed, and if they're in the ocean like this, they're being fed. fed uh, you know, uh, forage fish like anchovies and um, and herring and so forth from the ocean. So they're using fish to produce fish. Um, 
or they're using grains. But there's a lot of other issues too that are just like agriculture or livestock, uh, these fish escape into wild, you know, into uh, other water bodies. And I was talking, we were having a discussion earlier about some of the introductions and escapes today that you see all over the world. There's pollution issues of scaling up and so forth. And so is aquaculture better than eating meat? You know, this is one of the questions as we move forward that we want to know. And um, with a number of colleagues, we wrote a paper a few years ago where we actually looked at grams of intake per weight gain of the animal in question here. And you can see here is a pig here, okay, by comparison. A lot of it is carbohydrates, just grains, and then they need a certain amount of fat and then a certain amount of protein. And so the broiler chicken does much better, you know, grows faster, so relatively you're going to do better with the broiler chicken. Some of these freshwater species, whether it's the common carp or tilapia, kind of on comparison with a broiler chicken in terms of the feed input for weight gain. Now, some of these cold-blooded fish like um, Atlantic salmon, trout, actually do quite a bit better, okay? So, um, actually eating cold-blooded animals is probably better than eating warm-blooded animals. <laughs> I don't need to feed them as much. Um, but, but these salmon, for example, are taking a lot more protein and fats out of the fish, uh, you know, fish in, fish out. And so, finding feed substitutes, addressing the feed question, in short, is a big part of the solution that we're going to find. And I could go on for quite a long time about that. It's a big area that I work in. Um, but the other is that as aquaculture grows, it's not a free lunch. You know, where are we going to put all these systems, right? And um, this is actually an oyster farm in China. It's just phenomenal. Everything in China is so big, you know. Um, but you've got these systems, salmon farm and birch plumbing, you know, that are in pretty nice pristine systems. And, you know, so we've got, uh, right now, with China running out of water and land, other countries also feeling the same. You know, we're constrained on land for how much water and land we want to use for these systems. And so they're starting just to intensify pretty much more high-valued species, which is probably going to have more feed implications and so forth. Polyculture is, there's a number of practices that we can talk about that are very useful in these systems to really make the efficiency much better. Now the last of the revolutions in this middle income, income rising, is um, in this tropical oil seed revolution. This is, I'm writing a book with a few people on this right now, and um, the biggest growth that we've seen in the past decade or two has been in oil seeds. So this is soybeans in Brazil and this oil palm in Indonesia. Um, but unlike the Green Revolution, most of the growth is becoming from area growth, not from yield growth in these cases. And so we're trans, uh, really uh, transitioning big tropical forest areas, savanna areas, and so forth into these crops. And this is going into feeding livestock, feeding aquaculture to some extent. Um, and oil palm is used um, more in processed foods, all the processed foods that are starting to be consumed by all these uh, populations with income growth too. And so this is not really dealing with food security per se, it's actually contributing probably more to uh, obesity, coronary disease, and so forth. And so it's a big lucrative business though, and most of it is used for food and food processing. Um, and the, the big question is fuel. Fuel comes in being profitable at certain times, and as we know, the emerging economies, they may top out in their food demands over time, but the fuel demands are just going to keep going. And so how we look at the ener energy sector overall is going to be really important to how our agricultural systems look globally in the future. So what I worry about with the soy and the oil palm is the deforestation and its contribution to climate. And the big second issue that I want to put on the table is climate change. Um, the consensus is definitely that climate change is happening. We may be in a long run variability pattern now, but temperatures are clearly going out of the realm of natural variability. And, um, and so a lot of science, obviously, in the IPCC has been done on that. Now, when we look at what impacts it has on agriculture, we're worried about like temperature stress on crops and moisture stress, what's going to happen to pests and pathogens, um, even the native crop genetic resources might not survive. But um, let me show you what we're thinking about. So here, if you have temperature in the blue here is the past 100 years. And so some years 
were very cold, some years were really warm, the median, so the probability the mean was sort of in this area. What people worry about is these hottest, hottest growing seasons in the past may in fact become the mean in the future and um, by the end of this century. And then another question is, uh, is that what we expect? Or in fact, are the hottest years we've seen in the past century still going to be colder than anything we see? And um, I did some modeling with a climate scientist from University of Washington, David Battisti. And we, when you're looking at this, look at sort of orange and red colors. So we looked out into the middle of the century, over 70% chance in this dark brown, up to 90%. Mostly tropics and subtropics are going to be out of bounds, so out of any temperature they've ever experienced before. And by the end of the century, just a new world, okay? And, um, and this is just temperature effects in the temperature, growing season temperature in these areas. And this is using actually a very uh, A1BF moderate climate scenario with all of the IPCC runs. So it's integrating all of the science that's been in the IPCC. So, so what does this mean for agriculture? You know, there's been some really good studies now. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, David LaBelle at Stanford, um, has led kind of a group that's looking at what are the threshold, the uh, plant response thresholds to temperature. How far can we push this? Even you know, we tend to think of, okay, we're going to take, you know, be the big growers, but this is even too hot actually for our current crops to be growing and without yields really plummeting here. And so, um, so understanding and thinking about climate adaptation and that as a whole science, I think, is something that we're taking on quite seriously now. Another one of my colleagues has been looking at sort of the empirical evidence on how these kind of temperature events not, not feed in directly to agriculture, but feed into conflict because people um, probably lose their livelihoods. Um, so, so it's an interesting um, area to be looking forward to, but we don't actually have to look forward to see the stress, okay? So you probably remember in 2012, in India they had a late monsoon due to climate variability, and they had extremely hot weather in their main growing season, uh, the wheat growing season, or the wheat growing area up here. Um, water was very short um, because the monsoon hadn't come in, and um, and because of the heat, um, more you know air conditioning, the energy was being used for a lot of things. Of course, farmers wanted to use energy to pump water because there wasn't any water. And it created this brownout. Do you guys remember this brownout? It lasted for many days, affected 700 to eight, seven, six to 700 million people. Like a tenth of the world's population was in a blackout in India for um, several days, you know, because of excess pumping and drought. You know, so this is energy, climate, water, everything connected. And why are these guys pumping so much? Well. The government was allowing them to pump, first of all, because there was about to be an election, and they said, you know, they wanted to make sure that they had the votes and so forth. So these are complicated issues, and we're already seeing how they intersect when you have a lot of demands on the system. So the last, so the governance issue, the last point I want to just make here is on governance, and, and we work on governance quite a bit at Stanford at the Freeman Spotley Institute. Um, and so, First of all, a lot of people tend to think that um, governance is sort of synonymous with democracy, that if you have democracy, that you have good governance over the system. And so one of the questions I think that we've been posing really to you is democracy really a prerequisite for solving the food security problems? And you know, I would argue no, you know, the biggest success we've seen is Suharto, who was hardly democratic during the 70s and 80s in Indonesia. Obviously, the Chinese government's not democratic. Uh, there is a top-down, we're going to get this done attitude, but it requires the right leadership and the right priorities, otherwise, you know, the Mao time was just the opposite in China. Um, and then you look at democracies like India, and you still have big segments of the population that's not fed well. Um, I think one of the biggest failures of our democracy is that we have 50 million people on food stamps. You know, so, so, so there are problems in how how you deal with this. I don't think it matters one way or the other if you're a democracy or not. But there still are big challenges of why do governments fail in their quest. 
you know, a lot of times they're dealing with sort of yesterday's problems. So China's still trying to put staple crops on the table, and they're not really yet going towards we need more micronutrients, better nutrition for our whole population <coughs> to have educational attainment and so forth. And Scott's been doing the studies. He can see the direct correlation. Give iron supplements, test scores go up. <laughs> now the government's focused, you know, because the evidence is starting to be there. So looking ahead is really important, and it's not just in nutrition. It's also going to be in this climate area, I think. Um, but as we all know, you know, agencies are siloed. You know, water and um, energy and agriculture don't always talk to each other on these, and that classic case in India was one of them. And it's really tough if you were running the country in an area that is very food insecure to think, how should I put the priorities on producers versus consumers? Producers want high prices, consumers need low prices, and you need kind of a line of credit to stabilize that price in there that's not always easy to do. And so it's a, it's a tough challenge, especially since many net consumers are also farmers in these countries. And so, um, so some of these issues are, are difficult, but we've played out, seen very successful policies. Often, uh, there's just a focus on agriculture policy and not on food policy. And food is what we're aiming for. Bangladesh is the first country that I know of big scale recently that has adopted a Ministry of Food now instead of Ministry of Agriculture. And I'm really uh, anxiously kind of looking at, at that. And of course, these countries in conflict, that's just something that's really difficult to solve. I, in ending, I'll just say last December, I had the pleasure of, of sitting across the table at dinner with um, Earthrin Cousins, who runs the World Food Program now, and she was saying at that time in December they could not get enough money to feed you know the refugees from Syria that were in Jordan. One in thirteen people in Jordan are now Syrian refugees. So you know how how are you dealing with this problem? And and it's so challenging in her case of saying um, people are tired of you know they don't see you know some of you have been in this, but um, they don't see why should I spend money in a place like this that's so messed up and so forth. And so it's getting people to focus on feeding the world as a whole and what that means that's, I think, really, really critical. It's, it was really interesting. They did get enough money. Otherwise, they were having to send the Syrians back, um, out of Jordan, back home, because um, they just couldn't feed them. So, you know, the consequences are huge. Um, and how we deal with these conflict states is a really, really tricky issue, actually. So I just want to leave you with some thoughts um, as I wrap up, like what do I think the priority should really be. Um, first of all, uh, you know, positioning food and nutrition as central <coughs> policy and educational issues, I think just has to become a priority of all countries, like including the United States. Um, there's no education about food in most schools. I mean, there may be in Milbrook, but there's not in most schools. And, and, um, and it's really hard to think how, uh, how to actually change our whole food system without getting more of a policy focus on it. And, and it's not just the United States, too. It's in every country that's dealing with food security issues. Um, second is to invest in agricultural technology. And I'm thinking particularly about seeds for the future. And so. Um, seeds aren't everything, but they are really important because investing now, it takes about a generation to have the seeds in the ground. And so um, if there's not public investment in a variety of seeds, then what we're saying is it's okay just to have, you know, Monsanto's control all seed delivery. You know, I mean, there needs to be much more of a public good here in a wide range of seed um, seed technologies for, I think, a wide array of crops, not just rice, wheat, and corn going forward. Um, the third is to invest in distributed water and energy resources in Africa and Asia that can be smaller scale um, and monitored to not burn out the resource. And this is a public good as well that I think is interesting and has proven to be, it's a public good, but it's proven to be very, very profitable and high returns in the short run. And then the last I just put on conserving crop genetic diversity because um, one of my friends, Carrie Fowler, actually had run the crop, Global Crop Diversity Trust. And it was clear to me that if we don't save the basic lifeblood of our crop systems, uh, you know, we're not going to have the genetic material to deal with things like climate change in the future. So 
I would love to hear what you think the priorities will be, and I'll stop talking now. Thank you.
per se, but but I would, you know, it's not something that I would put in, bank on in any way. Yeah. In one of your early slides, you said the population of Africa is expected to rise by two billion, and then one of the last slides, you said it's going to be the warmest ever. So are we looking at like widespread famine there, and does the one projection take the other into account? Yeah, it uh, it, it is. Oh, so it was, yeah. So you're wondering would you just have the most of the projections on the population are assuming constant mortality. So, you know, so that's not taking into account a higher <coughs> mortality rate. Nor is it taking account of, like how climate might affect things like Ebola or other diseases that could wipe people out. Um, but Africans, as, as you know, are moving quite rapidly to Europe already, you know, uh, by the thousands every day. And so I think the migration aspect is going to be much more worrisome. And, you know, people say, well, just uh, industrialize, and people can move the cities. Well, that's kind of impractical because they don't really have an industrial base. You know, so if that's going to be the case, you know, how is that actually going to play out? It's hard to imagine. So this is growing season temperatures, and some of the adaptation strategies can still be um, with some irrigation, different kinds of crop, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. But it's still going to be, I think, uh, my guess is the mortality also will increase, you know. Um, but I think the pressure, if you combine heat, population, and conflict, is going to be um, quite high, you know. And whether it's conflict internally or through migration, I think it's going to be a pretty tense situation there. So, so I think it does deserve quite a bit of attention. And a number of African countries are doing much better now in terms of economically and so forth. And now's the time to engage in them. There's still kind of some basket cases, you know. So it's 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 definitely uh, definitely challenging. Yeah, yeah. Biden and the nutrients being available. So, yeah, it's it's a great question because you think, okay, just provide supplements, right? And or or like for us, we have um, vitamin A enhanced bread, or you know, I mean, we have all this, and and one of the jambos, that, you know, has been um, proposed is this golden rice that has uh, vitamin A in the rice, but I, I think that's not going to go that far because it's yellow; it's not what people prefer, and so forth. But just um, either supplements or fortifying processed foods to those that live in at least urban areas is, is one thing, you know, like we fortify our bread and our basic staples. We fortify our salt, you know, with, um, and so forth. And so, um, but, um, but those basic supplements, so my friend uh, Scott Roselle, who's been doing all these studies, going into these China areas, and he's, um, has, the, has the control group, and then he has the treatment group is like you have to have a vitamin supplement every day, you know, and, and they give them the vitamin supplements, not very expensive, you know, and and they have to like force this down, you know, it's just not what it's, and then they finally get the community on board and they give the supplements to the parents and grandparents and you just, and they just throw them out, you know, I mean, they're, so the educational part is like really challenging, it's not that easy, but it's, it's it can be overcome, you know, so I don't, you know, so this is another, Feel that they could be brought in, you know, on education. That so when they take them, it's quite effective. And um, the way that he's been measuring it has been in um, IT, uh, IQ scores as well as in test scores. And so they do these IQ tests, even for these little like babies. These IQ tests take a long time for these babies, actually. Um, but um, but they're finding the orders of magnitude difference when they're taking them. Yeah. So. So the, the, the when the so it's powerful and and you should be able to say okay here is the result and doesn't this seem obvious but then the translation is not so obvious and so my students were really asking so I had to come to one of my classes the, um, in the winter to talk about that and he said well you get into these rural areas you got the grandparents and they're not you know sort of dealing with it he said his comment which was interesting to me he said. In a lot of cases, there's not kind of the intellectual bandwidth because them they too have been stunted. They're you know they're they're not thinking about this kind of thing. So 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 it's kind of challenging, but I think there are avenues certainly to get into it. And in our West Africa case, 
Um, the biggest uh, crime in that area is these kids coming and stealing the carrots. And we're like, oh well, you know, <laughs> if they're stealing the carrots, that's, that's okay. So, and, and actually what they've done in, in the West Africa case, they've built that model. So it's not supplements, it's actual food they can see in the ground. So they built that model into the curriculum and the kids are going out and measuring and learning their math and other things based on these. New so it's kind of cool. So I think you have to do it more kind of organically in that way where it's not this strange like pill that somebody trying to kill me. They're, they're really suspect, you know, in, in parts of China. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, the GMO thing with uh, herbicide resistant plants, uh, do you have any sense of the quantity of Roundup now compared to 10 years ago? Is that a factor of like a thousand? Um, you know, it's, it's a... If so, <laughs> has anyone studied what that's doing to the soil and the nutritional value of the food? Are we going to start having less value in the food that's coming out of less healthy soil? Yeah, so... Um, so there, there. I, I can get. The, I don't have the statistic on, but I could get the statistic. There are reports on how much is used, and um, and most of it is applied, you know, to soybeans. And then the soybeans are mostly going into animal feed. The meal is eighty percent meal and twenty percent oil, so it's mostly going into animal feed. The Chinese actually. I had a, an interesting, and I, I'm not trying to pick on China, but China imports. 60% of world soybeans. So, you know, they're big, okay? And I was having a conversation with them. They're very worried about the GM, you know, soy that they're getting because the, the meal they don't care about feeding it to the pigs, but they are worried about the oil that they use for the cooking and everything. And, um, and they, I was in a big room, not quite as big as this, and they were asking me this, and they said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm more, I would be more worried if you were using palm oil for your oil because then, you know, all the forest would be gone. And they all talked, you know, it was all, you know, Chinese, uh, and, then, and then all of a sudden there was this huge applause, you know. And, um, and I asked my student who was doing some of the translating, I said, what just happened? And they said, well, they, they, uh, they decided that what you thought, because you wanted, you know, the soy oil and not the palm oil, was you'd be willing to risk your life to save the rainforest, and they thought that was good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Look out for them. But, but you know, so, so um, I, I think it's having an effect on, you know, I, I know it's having an effect on the ecosystem, and I do worry about the bias, and, you know, the soils and everything. You know, it's just too, too big a, too big thing. It's used year after year after year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, the glyphosate is the, is the uh, herbicide. And, you know, there's been all sorts of, uh, studies and hypotheses about frogs and bees and you know all of this stuff with this stuff even though it's a less potent uh, herbicide than other ones and so it's just not a good idea to keep using the same thing over and over and over you know I mean I, I, I think if I was going to have my several silver bullet maybe we need to end this way is to have more crop diversification and rotation I mean get on with not having these uh, monocultures too much because you know, a farmer that has soybeans two years and corn soybeans, not technically a monoculture, right? But, but let's get on with a much more diverse system for our nutrition as well as all of these things and take GMOs off the table. That's my vote. But uh, anyway, I've enjoyed talking to you. I can stay around and talk some more if you'd like. Thanks for the report. books on the evolving sphere of food security out in the lobby afterwards. Also, I want to let you know that we have a very busy Friday night to carry next Friday. Uh, we are going to have a presentation by a photographer, Robin Moore, um, called In Search of Lost Frogs. So for those of you who love amphibians, particularly beautiful colored amphibians, uh, it will be a great, great performance, I think. And then following in the end of May on May 29th, our own Rick Ostfeld will be talking about the ecology of Lyme disease. Uh, as many of you know, we published a paper recently that showed that the emergence of nymphs from uh, ticks is now happening in April, not May. So number one, be careful. Right? The ticks, despite the weather, the ticks are out there. Uh, and number two, come find out why and how climate change is unfortunately not going to solve that problem. Uh, so thank you for coming. And on Sunday, not to miss this, uh, there is a walk in the Fern Glen just up the road a bit uh, called Nature's Clock Fern Glen Phenology Trail. 
and it's looking to detailing and runs our monitoring programs. We'll be talking about how the fern gland and the emergence of different plants at different times will tell us how seasons change. So uh, as always, uh, those are free and open to the public. So uh, we're looking to see you at 1 o'clock on Sunday, I guess, park in the parking lot here and then walk down. So thank you very much for coming in. Thank you.